Well, they had been living in Paris before the war began, and then in 1939, my grandfather realized that they were in danger. France hadn't, this, it was the summer of 1939, so France hadn't actually entered World War II yet, but he realized that things were looking bad for Jews in Europe, and he got the sense that living in Paris, where there were lots of Jews, was dangerous. So he decided to move the family to a tiny village, Saint-Georges-sur-Cher, which is in the center of France, and they just moved there because they had been there on vacation. And so they moved and lived in this little village, and then France was invaded and um, the Nazis took over the northern part of France and as it turned out their village was just on the south side of the river that was between the two zones of France, the occupied zone and the unoccupied zone. So they were in the unoccupied zone, the safer zone for Jews. Um, so while they were in this tiny village my grandfather was trying to get papers to get the family out of the country which was extremely difficult to do. Um, the most difficult thing to do was to get an entrance permit to another country. But luckily, my father's family had a relative in the United States, and this relative was willing to fill out what was required, which was called an, affida an affidavit of support. So this relative had to say that they would support the family for several years if the family couldn't find work in this country. So the, they finally got that affidavit, they finally got their exit, permits from France, they got entrance permits through uh, uh, into Spain and Portugal, and they, they left through Spain and Portugal and, f and took a ship from Portugal to um, the United States. So that's the escape route they took, although their ultimate destination was the U.S., there were no ships leaving from France. But it was really difficult to get all that paperwork done, so they were in the, country for, um, in the countryside for two more years. And they, in fact, left in November of 1942. Um, and later that month, the Nazis occupied the entire country. So they really just left just in time. They were on the last boat leaving Europe. My father says the last boat was civilians leaving Europe before um, the Nazis occupied the whole country. The ones who were caught in the country were first put in internment camps in France, and then they were sent, um, many of them were sent to um, concentration camps in Poland. And my father's close friend was, um, child friend was sent um, to Auschwitz that way. Um, so yeah, many French Jews were, were killed. Um, many French Jews did survive the war, but um, many others were killed. Uh, well, Drancy is the most famous one, um, which is outside Paris. Like my father didn't tell these stories very freely, so he would tell little snippets. Um, there'd be like one little anecdote and another little anecdote, and I kind of knew even as a child not to press too hard for the whole story, because it was obviously traumatic for him to talk about it. Um, and his relatives who were in hiding don't talk too freely about it either. But I do know that they were hidden for a while in what the French called caves, which are um, caves or basements um, in below the, um, the house where they lived in Saint-Georges. For a while, his, some of his relatives were hidden in the basements there by the daughter of a farmer who lived nearby. Um, some of them escaped into Switzerland, but um, the Swiss government was very um, cagey about who they would let into the country. They weren't eager to have Jews coming into the country either. So the rules kept changing. And at one point, um, one of my father's, I can't remember all the relations, cousin, basically, they're some kind of cousin, second cousin, cousin once removed, and so on. Um, the women and children were allowed in, but the men were put in concentration camps because the Swiss would only let in women and minor children. So some of the, his male relatives, adult male relatives, were put in camps, and they did survive. Two of them did survive. Um, these were, I think, internment camps in France, as opposed to the rather worse um, camps in Poland. They did go back for visits. They went back at one point in the 50s. Um, and then my father didn't go back until the 90s. Uh, at one point, he went back with me and um, his aunt, uh, my aunt, his sister, and the three of us went traveling around France and visited various places that they'd lived and various people they'd known. Oh, well, it was very interesting for me. Um, I think it was traumatic in some ways for them. And, and while I was taking that trip with them, I heard some of the stories that ended up 
going into the novel. Um, I heard what had happened to some of their friends and um, I think that was the first time that my father heard some of the details about what had happened to his close friend, um, Jojo Liebert, who died during the war. Um, this friend became the model for Marcel, Marcel in my um, novel, Black Radishes, The Mischievous Kid. Um, he was a close friend of my father's and he um, unfortunately was a kid who talked freely about things and even though he should have known that his family was in the French resistance and that they, he shouldn't have been talking about this at school. He went to school and he talked at school about how his family had guns and tracts against the Nazis and another kid at school um, informed upon him and the, um, um, they were taken away from their apartment in Lyon and sent to Auschwitz where they, um, he and his mother and father all died. Well, I was I was pleased um, because people seem to think, you know, well, I, it's just easy. You heard the story, you write it down. It's not, you know, you have to imagine your way into it. And um, for me, the hardest thing was actually imagining my way into the mind of my main character, who is an 11 year old Jewish boy living in France in 1939, because of course I was not a child in France during 1939. And I had to really imagine what that would be like and what that child would have experienced. Um, and my sister said to me at one point, I'm amazed at how you got, how you imagined this all out from the very reserved stories that dad tells. Because he would tell a little anecdote, but he would never talk about his feelings or, you know, what it was like for him or anything emotional. So I had to really imagine my way into it. And then I had to create the texture of daily life, which that for me was a difficult thing because I wanted to get all the details right of daily life. And that's an extremely hard thing to find out. And I discovered that you have to know history so well to write historical fiction, so much more intimately than you have to know it to write um, scholarship. Because I'm also, a, you know, I'm also a literary scholar, and I write about the relationships between novels and history. I interviewed people in America. I um, did go to France and interviewed some people in the village where my father lived. So I was taking photographs of the outside of the house where they lived, and out came a very nice woman who lives in the house now and wanted to know why I was taking photographs of her house <laughs> and uh, she invited me in and she and her husband talked with me and they uh, he had lived through the war although she was a bit younger so he told me stories about the war and um, gave me a tour of their garage where there were pictures drawn on the walls that soldiers had drawn there during World War One actually um, so yeah I interviewed actual uh, people who, who had memories of the war in America and in France and I read history in, in um, you know, historical accounts because uh, I wanted to know details like um, what, what exactly was it like on the demarcation line? What did you have to have to cross the line? What kind of paperwork did you need to show to the German guards, for example? Um, how hard was it to get that paperwork? Um, so that I found in some traditional works of history, but I also then read memoirs, um, as I said, um, those often were the most useful thing because I would be reading along and it would be interesting but not very relevant to my project and then suddenly I'd come to some detail that I wanted to know. Like I really wanted to know the color of the wrappers of Meunier chocolate bars because the Meunier family um, and their chocolate bars figure in the novel and at one point I wanted, I had a child opening up a chocolate bar and I wanted to have the color of the wrapper right. Yeah, well most Americans haven't heard of them because you don't see them much in this country but they are a French radish and it's also found in Germany so um, they, they're they enormous. They're not like what Americans think of. We think of these little, little red radishes but they are um, more like gigantic carrots and they're deep black on the outside and snowy white on the inside. And they taste a lot like red radishes, but maybe a little uh, sharper and a little sweeter. Well, I would say it's for children about ages nine and up. I am getting a lot of interest in it from adult readers, especially adults who remember the war. Um, and that's very gratifying to me, especially when French people who have lived through the war read the book and, and feel as if it resonated with their experience. So that's gratifying to me. So. Um, I am hearing that from some adults, but um, it was really meant for children um, ages about 9 to 14. And um, because it doesn't have anything to, um, there's no, no really horrific violence, there's no representation of concentration camps because it stays with the experience of this one boy whose family escaped. Um, 
it's a relatively, I think, non-threatening way for children of that age to begin learning about the history of that time. I have a daughter, she's 12 years old. She's been very helpful to me, actually. Um, she took the author photo on the book, she's very proud um, that her name is on the uh, book jacket. And she was very helpful to me. I think she really helped me understand what a child mind is like and what a child's experience is like and she also read um, drafts of the book for me and I said to her Anna tell me honestly when something is boring or when you don't understand something mark it in the margin and she did a great job well my next book is tentatively called green and unripe fruit although my editor and I are not sure that's the right title for it because we're not sure that's appealing enough to kids but to me it gets at the heart of the story but it's it's con the continuation of the story in Black Radishes. It's what Black Radishes ends as Gustav and um, his parents are, are leaving on the ship for um, the United States. So it, it takes up where that book ends and it begins with Gustav and his family coming to the United States and coming to New York in 1942. And at the heart of the story is that Gustav is um, believes that America is a country where all men are created equal. That's where he's heard. So he f feels that it's going to be a country that's free of the kind of racial discrimination that he encountered in France. And it's about his discovery of to what extent that's true and to what extent that's not true in America in 1942. Well, I was delighted the book won a Sidney Taylor silver medal, which is um, their um, honor as an honor book for older readers. Um, the Sidney Taylor Award is for um, um, the best children's book in the year um, for, uh, that represents the Jewish experience. And I was especially pleased to get it because it's named for Sidney Taylor, whose books, All of a Kind Family, were favorites of mine when I was a girl growing up. And in fact, I remember being read aloud the first book that won the award. It won the award in 1968, and I remember being read it in fifth grade. It was Esther Houtzig's The Endless Step, uh, which was also a very haunting book and a favorite book of mine as a child. I, I think you said I love those books, and I, I love those books growing up, and they are very memorable to me. I feel as if books I read when I was a child had a very deep imprint, created a very deep imprint on me as a person, maybe more than books I've read as an adult. So for example, as an adult, I've read Jane Eyre over and over again. I teach Victorian literature, um, and I love that book, and I, I know that book very well. But I'm not sure it, even still um, on the umpteenth reading that it's had the same effect on me as books I read when I was a child. I feel as if um, children's books make a very deep imprint on their readers and that's what I would like to do as a writer.